First day of DrupalCon, everybody. I very much appreciate you taking your first day at 9 a.m. to come see me and listen about and learn about saving time upgrading from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 with Retrofit for Drupal. Um, my name is Matt Glaman. If you don't know me, I am a principal software engineer at Acquia. Previously of Commerce Guys, worked on Drupal Commerce a bunch. Um, I'm the maintainer of PHP Stan and Drupal, the extension that makes PHP Stan do stuff with Drupal. A lot of you use it for your major upgrade readiness, the Composer Lenient plugin, and also Retrofit Drupal. Um, so first, let's walk through a few of the challenges that you face when doing a Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 migration. Um, you probably have heard a lot of talks about this in the past on these topics, and maybe there's some happening today. So we all know that you have to migrate existing content and configuration to its new schema. In Drupal 7, content types are defined in code, now they're configuration, little things like that. And this is the one area that our Drupal community has excelled at. We have the migrate module, we've invested so much time into it. In fact, there's even like the Acquia Migrate Accelerate, which was recently open source, and I'll touch on that. Um, we focused a lot there. And the Acquia Migrate module, here's an overview for it. It extends the existing Migrate UI, and it tells you how to finish your data migration so that we can be successful in porting and moving from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 with your data. If you do want to learn more about that, uh, Mike Madison has a session tomorrow at 150 and see you 120 through 122 back that way. But there's more than just migrating data. We all know about the old way of doing Drupal core. Drupal core released an update, let's rewrite our code. So you have to rewrite that existing code from the legacy APIs to their modern equivalents. I normally don't like putting code in slides because it's hard to read, so I try to put like a pretty basic example here. Who here has written hook menu before to add a custom page? All right, good, it's most of everybody. In Drupal 7, the hook menu was the routing system, the menu system, the local tasks, the local actions, and probably like three things underneath the hood as well. In Drupal 8, those are split out into their own specific APIs. So that hook menu, in this example, you have your routing.yaml, which says here's the path, here's the controller, which is the callback. You could still use the same function if you wanted to, but now we use classes for a lot of things. And then permissions would also be defined. And then the fact that in this previous one, we said menu name is main menu. Well, now the menu definition lives in links.menu.yaml. So it's its own separate API, the menu API. At least that's what I like to call it. So you're taking that one line of code and converting it to two APIs that are now in YAML files versus PHP. It's not the hardest thing in the world, but it's contextual and work that has to be done. Then themes, right? Every time somebody upgraded their Drupal site, it's like, let's just rebrand the site because why not? We're touching the theme. Let's throw it out. It's like four years old. Um, and then you'd have to rewrite it from PHP template to Twig, which I think is a good thing because Twig is more secure than writing PHP code for your template. But again, it's work. And then all of a sudden there's an extra line item on the budget of like, hey, let's just redesign the site also, which takes three months. And then another quick example on the left, we've got the PHP code, and then we got the Twig code, which looks more like HTML and regular templating. So you gotta rewrite your code, you gotta rewrite your theme, and then you're also gonna keep the lights on. You're doing maintenance for your existing platform. Your development team is getting new bugs and new tickets, new feature requests for that platform on Drupal 7 you invested in, while you're somehow in a sidecar building the new Drupal 10 site and migrating at the same time. Um, I know I have been on projects that have like the nightly migration as we're continually syncing data and then that is supposed to live for only a month and then it's six months later because they're doing more feature development on Drupal 7. But that's just how it works. There, you, you built things on Drupal 7, you built successful platforms and you have to migrate at the same time. So let's just do a quick refresher on when Drupal 7 loses support. I know it's been communicated a lot but just in case. Drupal 7, end of life, is January 5th, 2025. No more extensions. Personally, I wish it would have stayed at the previous one, but I understand we needed to build more tooling, which is something that Retrofit will help solve. That date, it's like, that's six months away. I know when I, I did this at, a preview of this at Twin Cities Drupal Camp, and that was like a year away. It's like, that's not too far. We got time. <laughs> Let's plan it in quarters. Let's get a little business here. We're in the first month in the Q2 right now. So that means you've got Q3, Q4, 
Drupal 7 is dead. That's about, if I put the math, that's 12 development sprints at two week sprints. How much does your team get done in a sprint? Is this something that you can do if you didn't start already in time? Now, there's gonna be solutions. If you're in that red quarter and you're on Drupal 7.1, it's not like all of a sudden the world's gonna explode. Um, unless there's like a major Drupal get in on that same day. And there's gonna be solutions talked about here. I don't wanna dive into those, but I want to talk about how you can go from this and be like, oh no, to saying, I think we can achieve that in two quarters. We can get on a Drupal 10 with our Drupal 7 code and get off the end of life core platform. So that's retrofit to Drupal, retrofit, because you're retrofitting your Drupal 7 code into Drupal 10 runtimes. This started as an idea actually about four years ago, but I was like, I don't need to create Franken Drupals. We don't need like people running Drupal 7 and Drupal 10. The people should just migrate. And that was a bit ignorant of me, not thinking about the effort it takes or the investment put into Drupal 7 sites. I have worked on sites where there's been millions of dollars invested in the platform. It's not easy to just flip a switch. So the current iteration did start as an idea at MidCamp, which I recommend going to next year in March 2025, uh, as a lightning talk and then talking to a few folks. Like, what if we didn't have to rewrite all the code in custom modules? I'm a team lead. I review code all the time. You know how cognitively draining it is to just read pull requests all the time? It's great because I'm checking code. I'm trying to train up juniors and mid-developers to be better. But when you're reviewing a diff that's 300 changes because it changed hook menu to a new controller to a YAML file, it's work that has to be done, but it can be mentally draining. So what if we could create a way to simplify that process to make the upgrade safer in the terms of writing better code or not touching code that somebody wrote eight, month, eight years ago, no longer at the company, but it's critical to the business function. Um, so like, what if we could solve that problem? And what if you didn't have to rebuild your theme from scratch? A friend of mine was just on a D7 a Drupal 10 port and they did port, or no, actually it was from ASP. So I guess they didn't have to rebuild the theme. And they did a verbatim port of the existing theme. So like, you don't have to necessarily need a theme rebuild. It usually kind of happens along the way. But what if you didn't need to touch the template files? What if your PHP template files just worked and maybe you tweaked a few things because that didn't have as many A to B connections, but you could just go. And that just brings home the point. What if you only needed to refactor 40% of your code instead of 98% of it? Because let's face it, form API, pretty much the same thing in Drupal 7. So if you got a form, you're moving it to the form classes. How much time could you save if you didn't need to touch every single line of code? And that's the premise. Retrofit provides compatibility layers that can run legacy Drupal code. So I know we've been saying like Drupal 8, 9, 10, we gotta stop saying version numbers now, it's just Drupal. There's just Drupal and then there's legacy Drupal which is seven, six, because I know there's still some six sites out there, even five. But like legacy Drupal code is everything before eight, before the modern symphony base of the platform. And by letting you have this, by giving you this compatibility layer, it enables you to migrate off Drupal faster, Drupal 7, not Drupal, Drupal 7 faster and easier. Again, because you're not rewriting every line of code, you're kind of just gonna copy, paste the module, verify it works, tweak it where you need to. And next thing you know, you've got Bartik from Drupal 7, not the Bartik back, at, like when Bartik got removed from core, no, why would we run the Drupal 10 version of Bartik? Let's get Drupal 7 Bartik in this site. Uh, I wanted to do a live video, but videos never work. So I got a few screenshots. It's um, so like in the menu, that hook menu example I showed before, that hook menu is running in this site and it's showing up in the menu that I placed in the sidebar. Um, these are all from the examples module, the D7 examples module, by the way. States, form, you want your form to work? Great, this is from the form example module and the states API still works because a lot of that really hard stuff of the form API, the way that we interact with it, did not change from seven to 10. So if you don't have to turn your form code from hook form into a class, you don't have to rewrite any of your forms. That's a lot of, that's a lot of time saved right now if you wrote custom forms. So like that can work. Blocks, I know I did a lot of work where we wrote custom blocks. And this takes your, what is it like hook block info, hook block view, hook block configure. There's like seven different block hooks that were turned into a single plugin Let's you place it, save it, and embed it in your site where it exists, where it was. 
So again, I hope some of you are seeing that and like, oh, well, I wouldn't have to touch this file. I wouldn't have to modify this thing or go to this class. Or if you aren't sure of it, talk a bit about how it works to try to explain what this magic is. First off, it's not a module. I know in Drupal we love to call everything a module. It's not a module. You can't just, you, it, once you add it to your code base via Composer, because we are on Drupal 10 and we are a PHP package, we use Composer for dependency management. It gets added in and it wires itself into Drupal service container and creates all those compatibility layers. So it's got event subscribers, it does service decoration, all these other little tricks to wrap around what Drupal provides in its APIs to call those legacy hooks and provide a little glue and bring things together. So an overview of some of the compatibility layers that were talked about. So hook menu, again, it will tap into the menu routing system and translate your hook menu tree to the local task, the actions, the menu, and the different routes. You don't have to create a controller, it will call your previous function back for you. It takes all of your hook block and it provides a block plugin. It says, hey, go invoke hook block info, and now all the plugins are there. And it will provide that compatibility layer for data. Hook form, again, I think this is the one that as somebody who did Drupal Commerce and worked on all these sites um, previously before Commerce, guys, I was at a company called Gaggle and we built a SaaS for K through 12 ed tech. We wrote a lot of custom forms and that would have been a pain to migrate but literally we would just use the same code. Um, hook field for custom fields, which is the widgets don't work yet, I don't think, but the formatters do and I think it picks up the custom field types so they can be saved. And one of the cool things was hook theme. Who, like, who remembers theme? Well, remembers, a lot of you might still be in Drupal 7. Theme functions, right? Hook theme, and by default, it calls a function that returns markup, and Drupal 8 was like, nah. Tweak templates, everything, more secure. Retrofit lets your theme function still work. Um, it provides a twig, it taps in, it provides a twig template that will invoke your legacy theme function and put that HTML into the twig, function, tw twig template itself. So you don't have to rewrite all your theme functions. Um, I don't know, I'm sure lots of people have implemented custom hook theme implementations. That right there could probably save a lot of time not having to convert all those theme functions to twig templates. Speaking of templates, um, PHP templates or tipple fips as I forgot we used to call them. Those work too. If you have a node.tpl.php in your theme, it's gonna override the Twig template and Drupal will pick it and it will just work. There's a big caveat there where Drupal, when seven to 10, there was like no, there was, there was a lot that changed under the hood for theming. So some of the classes might be missing, but it's really easy to just go into your template and rewire some of those classes and some of the global variables, then rewrite the entire HTML template from PHP to Twig. So it does that. It provides a lot of replacements for procedural functions. So Drupal used to have db underscore eight different functions. Provide those back so you don't have to go rewrite and touch every line of code. Again, the idea here is if you're doing a pull request with you and somebody went and all they did was replace db query, db select, to be backslash database some whatever the method is, that's a line of code you have to review and be like, well, did something change? Did something break? Is our core business logic gonna be buggy? Again, history in e-commerce. You touch something, you better make sure it's tested, and if you weren't the one that wrote it, you don't know if the business rules changed since then, or like, if there's a bug in that code, maybe that bug is a feature. And so again, the idea here is to avoid touching lots of code all at once to reduce the pain and suffering of bugs along porting. Um, the global user object, so I'm sure a lot of people use global user check access, it provides a layer for that. Same with um, the global language and a few others. Drupal used to have a hook process, so there's the pre-process hooks, the rendering, I think, and then process hooks, or it was pre-process, process, render. I could never get it straight, and that's why they removed it, because I think nobody could get it straight. But people still have hook process in their code because it wasn't sure on when to do things. It will register your hook process codes at the tail end of the pre-process. So it works the same way that every pre-process goes, and then your process hooks can iterate over the variables there. Oh, I did have a thing about template overrides here. So yeah, tuple fips are supported. 
And one really cool thing, cool but bad, does anybody remember when Drupal 8 removed the ability to add inline JavaScript and everybody's like, uh, I can't attach JavaScript anymore? Well, let me tell you, Drupal retrofit for Drupal brings you that back. <laughs> <laughs> Please no. <laughs> so this is why like a while ago, I was like, I don't know if I should really be doing this. Like I, I laugh, but it's funny because we know they're bad, but let's be real. You have a business and you have platforms that need to be migrated. You have clients that need to migrate. You need to get it done. So whether something's right or wrong, the job has to get done. This lets you get the job done and then fix it later. And later, I know we never go back and fix things later, but it gives you a chance to set up maintenance <laughs> scripts afterwards. I know. You know what? There's Drupal 5 sites still running, and if a retrofit causes like a Drupal 7 code to live another six years, that's kind of a monument to the fact Drupal 7 code's still working. Retro I, I'm going to look at it as like a find the positive spin. <laughs> um, so it allows adding inline JavaScript, JavaScript settings, so it will port your JavaScript settings to be Drupal settings, so that way your JavaScript can just be tweaked a little bit. Um, Drupal add CSS is also in here as well. And unsuccess like at Florida Drupal Camp, Mike and Nello challenged me to get the overlay module working in Drupal 10. <laughs> I was this close, but I forgot that I can't polyfill JavaScript with this. So it didn't work because it's using jQuery barbecue and whatever else. But it was a great challenge. But the fact is it was almost possible. And that's the goal of this project. So how to use it? Talk a little about a lot of the things it provides. You're not putting retrofit in your Drupal 7 site because Drupal 7 is end of life. That is the platform. Drupal 10 is supported. So you are going to add retrofit to your Drupal 10 code base, or rather, you're gonna create a new Drupal 10 code base, put retrofit, and then you're gonna cut out your modules from the Drupal 7 site, and you're gonna paste them into your Drupal 10 code base. And then, I forgot the one extra step here. You have to rename that info file. Actually, you have to the info file has to be converted to an info.yaml file. It's not that perfect. Sorry, you do have to change that a bit from the INI format to a YAML format. It's not the most horrible thing in the world. Um, but that way you can copy over your modules and themes and you can migrate your data. Because here's one problem about the migration process. If you have custom field types, custom blocks, those things need to exist in the new code base for them to migrate pro pro uh, properly, otherwise an error might be shown. So it's a very chicken and egg problem here. I need to migrate the data, but I need the code. Well, I need the data to test the code, but I need all of it to verify the site, and you kind of get in a loop, and like, how do you start? So I'm hoping this gives you that little jump start where you can get the MVP, start testing, iterative feedback, the whole agile development process in a box, which is why it says repeat four and five. Migrate the data, refactor your code. Keep going until you have a working working site and then you can launch. So the benefits of retrofit, let's kind of summarize a few of the things I have said. So again, the idea is that it allows incremental updates instead of upfront major changes. I'm sure we've all been there, touch that piece of code, like I, I am way smarter than four year old self or the person who wrote this and you do the changes and the tests aren't really there because in Drupal 7 it was simple tests and like be hat and like, oh, like, like, like kind of work. And then you go run the code you were fabulous with and refactored, and then it doesn't work. So the idea is that you can make these changes in a much smaller fashion to verify them along the way. Again, going back to, like, it will increase velocity because you're, doing, you're reducing the amount of refactoring for each change in cognitive load. I like to come back to there because as I've spent a lot of time as like a team lead, senior developer, trying to be like a mentor and reviewing code, and you can quickly go through like three epic PRs and like shut down because your brain just can't anymore. So if this can help, the, like you can task the work to like juniors and mids or even like the entire team, but then who's ever like kind of like overseeing it and helping be like the, um, the team captain, they should be able to mo move more nimbly as well and people aren't as burnt out. You don't have like the control room scenario where everybody's on fire for two weeks. You can just pump off the gas a little bit, a lot of bit. So again, the upgrade becomes safer and more reliable because you're refactoring less code. Again, every line of code you touch means that you could introduce a bug. Sometimes you fix a bug, but bugs are features because that's how it's worked for the past five years, for better or worse. 
Um, and the, again, this provides a longer time for refactoring legacy code. I know I just said you can fix it later. Sometimes we don't. Everybody chuckled. <laughs> this is true, but this is what that roadmap kind of looks like now. So again, we're in Q2. Let's say you leave DrupalCon, you come to this session, you see Mike Madison's, you see the other ones on this on all this topic. You're like, team, we're kicking butt in June, whenever is the start of Q3 starts, July, July. And you're in 12 sprints, you're gonna launch your Drupal 10 site because retrofit's letting you run your custom code and some of the contrib that didn't port. So again, that is a use case. If there's some of those Drupal 7 contrib that were left behind or they merge into this other module and they work way differently now, nothing's stopping you from kind of forking it and running it. Again, you're just taking on more external code you need to remove. Um, again, that code won't have security coverage like Drupal 7, I guess, so like be mindful of that, but in my opinion, it's just as, it's, there's just as many issues with that code as possibly your own custom code, so just treat it that way. So come Q4, you launch it, and then Q1, all of 2025, set up your sprints to do your keep the lights on, uh, actually, it's not even keep the lights on, it's innovative work, it's removing technical debt and delivering value to the stakeholders. So instead of pausing all that value delivery, you just say like, hey, we're gonna cruise here, we can build a new platform. Oh, we fixed in the Drupal 7 site. Let's cherry pick that commit to the new site, to the Drupal 10, because the code base didn't change a lot, so you can easily translate those fixes. Um, I haven't been on a lot of, mate, like I've been on some, but never like really huge Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 migrations, because with most e-commerce sites, like the data doesn't matter, it's on the ERP, just re-import it. But in the shoes I've been in, I can only imagine the challenges and difficulty. So a lot of this was solving the problems I could see that I deal with on a daily, amplified for those doing an upgrade like this. And this is a question I was asked about before. What about, I guess I could drop 10 because it's 10, 11, 12, 13. It technically could work and it could technically provide compatibility layers between major versions as well. Um, I don't know if I want to go down that route because Drupal 10 to Drupal 11 is looking pretty, pretty good um, now that we've kind of got our feet landed. Um, so for those, just to give some backstory there, I think 8 to 9 and 9 to 10 were hard because we had a very long Drupal 8 life cycle. Then 9 to 10 we had to play even more catch up, but I think we kind of have our feet flat so the major version upgrade should be not as drastic. They weren't as drastic as rewriting code, but we had some, some stumbles. So I don't know, Retrofit could provide that, but I think its main focus needs to stay on Drupal 7, at least for now, but it could be something that's used to help out with the major version upgrades if we need it to. And then I wanted to give some resources for folks. So it does have its website that's kind of there, retrofit-drupal.com basically gives a summary of this talk. Um, on my website, mglobin.dev slash tags slash retrofit, I have about four or five blog posts where I kind of go into some of the technical bits. So if you've ever wondered how template overrides work and they actually get recognized, there's a blog post about it because I dug into it because I was like, I actually have no idea how this works. Um, there is a demo video on YouTube. Again, I'll put these slides on Sessionize or publish them somewhere. Um, the screenshots I had earlier at the sample site, there is a demo code base on github.com slash retrofit dash Drupal slash demo. If you go to the GitHub org, it's there. So it's a Drupal 10 site with that Drupal 7 bar tick and the Drupal 7 contrib. It's got ddev. So that way you can just run ddev start and test it out um, and kind of play with it and say like, all right, I have some Drupal 7 code. Instead of like standing up a new one, take that demo example and just pop it in there and see what happens. Again, the code's on GitHub. It's not on Drupal.org. And then there's a Slack channel, um, Retrofit, so that way if you're using it, you have questions, you want assistance, I'm there. There's a handful of other people there as well. And you can get some assistance. I know it's a bit short, but usually there's lots of questions around this. So if anybody has questions, we can jump to those. All right, there's some hands. Where was this idea 10 years ago? <laughs> uh, for the recording, the question was, where was this 10 years ago? I had just started using Drupal. So I didn't have the wild ideas I have now. Here we go.
So make sure I just, what has this project taught me or could teach us about what we've done in the past that maybe wasn't the best, the best way and that we can get best practices from? I think we learned that ourselves by jumping to semantic versioning with Drupal 8 is we said we're gonna adopt Symfony and this will be the last time we re rewrite Drupal core because we're gonna put things in such a way. So like we've gone through that pain and I feel like we've, again, like I briefly mentioned with Drupal 8, Drupal 8 lived way too long. And that's why we had the pain of jump, jumping from Symphony 4 to 6 with 8 to 9. And then we had the CK editor. We, we, we jumped, like we learned the lesson, but we kind of like landed and stumbled a bit and we've learned how to work with our dependencies and have aligned releases. So I think like, again, like I said, I don't know if this needs to provide compatibility from 10, 11, 12, et cetera, because we've done a really good job. Um, actually, and for folks who want to learn more about Drupal 11 readiness, there's a boff at 2.30 today I'm helping run that's about Drupal 11 readiness because I've helped write some of the utility tools that make that easier. So taking from both sides of this, we're, do, we're killing it right now for Drupal 11. I just, you know, I feel like if you look back even like three years when I was losing my mind, we're, we're way beyond that. So I think we learned our lessons and we're doing really good at it. We just never had something like this. We focused on really improving Drupal 8 and then the whole major version readiness, but not necessarily tooling for the Drupal 7 folks. All right. Here, I'm gonna go in there. Yeah, uh, how long, because it's not a monolith, um, how, how many versions of Drupal like, compared one to Drupal 7 to Drupal 7 to Drupal 11? Like, how, how long is that after Drupal 8? All right. Um, so the question was like, how long would the maintenance window be to get retrofit to support Drupal 11 after Drupal 10 and et cetera, correct? Immediately, because the idea is if it works for Drupal 10 and there's, de oh, okay, I see actually the question. If there's a deprecation in 10, how long would it take to provide that fix so that way it could go to 11? It should, as far as I know, since like with the PHP stand Drupal work and upgrade status and all of that, I have a somewhat good plug on like what's changing. I haven't seen anything come down the pipe that would that would cause it to break. Um, let's say Symphony 6, they said that event subscribers might start to return the array type hint on the method. Well, Retrofit will do that and then you, if we're mapping anything to those event subscribers, so I don't think, I don't think there'll be much pain. It should be pretty easy to do. Honestly, if anything, it's not the major versions that could bite retrofit, it's the ma minor versions because it's touching APIs and things it shouldn't. But so like there is that one caveat, but again, there's testing that happens with every minor version that I think there's always a way. And if there's one thing I've admitted I'm good at, it's finding ridiculous things and fixing them. <laughs> so I, I don't think it's gonna be that hard of a challenge. Yes. I'm gonna, and then I'll make my way up this way. Okay, the question was around PHP versions and MySQL compatibility. Retrofit won't do any of that, but I've also, while doing this for Kix, I found code in PHP that I wrote in middle school, so like 2002 era, and I slapped it in a PHP 8.3 container, and there was no errors. Like it was using my, oh wait, no, the one was it was using MySQL instead of MySQL I. PHP, although it's had breaking changes along the way, you had to have some pretty, Maybe not pretty obscure code, but you had to have some very specific code, in my opinion, for it to break. And I have seen some of those. I mean, my, her name is escaping me, but she like works on a bunch of legacy applications and finds those quirks. But these are like epic applications that retrofit can't help you there. But what it can do, your Drupal 7 code, bam, Drupal 10, you test running it, and you can find the error, fix the syntax, and you're good to go. My SQL. I don't know, but also if you're not writing any direct SQL queries, you're using the, AP, the database API layer, you should be good. I mean, I know I've hit that even between MySQL and SQLite, like doing mathematics in the query, like things don't work all the same all the time. Hopefully the database API layer just makes it work unless you have very specific queries you've written. But even then, I feel like if you're not doing aggregates, 
I would hope it just works between five and eight. So the question is, does retrofit leave a mark saying, hey, you have this old code and it's not running yet or of that sort, right? Like, does it leave any marks to tell you what's not covered? No, because it's kind of one of those, you don't know what you don't know. So there's all these legacy APIs and it has to know how to invoke those hooks. And even then there's one like, I forgot that hook, that blocks have like six different hooks that used to exist. So it does not, that's kind of one of folks test it and say, hey, this didn't run and then open an issue. You know, like one example is I would love to create a separate package for C tools. So like C tool specific compatibility layers in its own package because that's like a platform of its own. It has such an API layer that it would be really hard to know to say, oh, this isn't running yet. What could be done is Retrofoot could, instead of solving the problem up front, create things that listen in on those hooks and then give a warning like, hey, we detected that you had Hook field widget, yeah, let's do hook field widget. Hook field widget, we know that you have this, we don't have it yet, log, log a message, but then it's like, what do we tell them? Like, hey, come fund the project or contribute to it? I'm not sure what the messaging would be, but it doesn't do any tracing like that though. So that would be more of like, somebody's using it and realizes something's not there that they thought might be there. Um, and honestly, this is like the biggest problem I'm currently facing, like how do I document properly what APIs it supports? Because it's not like a, HTTP API, it's like, there are these hooks, and now they work here. So that is a uh, thread I'm chasing down right now. That helps, does that answer? Yeah, it's a, I, I know, and I think there could be a way, but it's like, every time you go, it's like a mirror, mirror maze. You kind of think you're going the right way, then you kind of like, oh wait, actually there's this one problem. It, it sits in place, right? It doesn't do a conversion. It, it, it sits in place. Cool. Yeah, so it sits in place, it's a shim. Originally it was called Drupal shim, right? Yeah, er, there's an early that Drupal 7 end of life podcast, I called it the Drupal shim, and I was like, we need a better, it needs a better name. Um, so yeah, that's the problem. It, it has to know what it's looking for to report it, and that's where we could add stubs in place that kind of like reach out, but then would say like log a message, like, hey, we detected this, but it's not running yet. Just so that way maybe people don't look at it and go like, this sucks because it didn't work. It's like, hey, I know you're, you've got this code, it's just not ready, it's not compatible yet. Right, there's just no point where it crawls your site. Cor yeah. Correct, yes, there's no point where it crawls your site because it's completely runtime. So when the site runs, it executes and all that. All right. So I'm wondering about the next step, what happens in 2025? Okay. So first of all, um, are there director rules that do the same sort of thing, converting oh. hooks into plugins? And second of all, Suppose my Drupal 7 code is not really very well decoupled. Is, is it going to be really painful to convert it to modern Drupal? Okay, now let me make sure I get the question. So what happens in 2025 when oh, the module, okay, wait, the, what was the first half of it again? I focus on the last, last half. So, so the code is running Oh, Rector, okay. So the question is, are there automated ways to upgrade from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 using something like Rector? So you've got Retrofit, you're running, now it's time to migrate the code. Can you use tooling to make that a little bit faster? Which to my knowledge, Drupal Rector right now does not have seven to 10 rules. It is mostly on deprecations because it could be done. So if anybody here wants to come learn about the PHP abstract, abstract syntax tree library and working with Rector, it's, it sounds, like what? It's actually really easy once you get it, but the problem is like there's a few domain experts in the community right now, like myself, Bjorn, um, Ken from Palantir, that not, who helps main, who's the maintainer of it, and a handful of others, but everybody's focused on the major version, so if it's like, oh, I would love to write rules that do this. There is also the module upgrader project, which I don't know what it's using under the hood, and that could be one, but again, I think that's like a big bang effect where it, rewrites the entire module, where a rector will be great, like I, today, am going to target this one specific port instead of everything all at once. 
Um, and then the second half of that was, what if my code's not that decoupled so it's really difficult to migrate? Well, I guess at least retrofit will be available so that way you can keep running that code to figure out how to chisel away at it. That, I mean, or, or it just sits and you're kind of like, well, this is life and this is what it has to be. But I figure in some way or form, it could be chiseled away enough to be abstracted so that way you could plug it in without like rewriting the entire code. Think of it like a modern Drupal where you're like, I will write a service that my controller hits, that cron hits. Instead of rewriting the code in five places, you just try to find a way to not decouple it completely, but put it in a place that then it could be called without retrofit, say. All right, I'm gonna try to make my way. All right, who has had their hand up for longer? I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna go here, then I'll go there, then I'll go there. Okay. I didn't even see it explicitly called out, but like you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So before I begin, the question was, what about views? <laughs> um, so Drupal doesn't even migrate views config. Now this is ignorance on my part. I, Aqua migrate accelerate. I don't know if it does. Maybe it does. I don't know. But views is a whole thing. And remember, views in Drupal 7 was C tools based. And in Drupal now, it's core based. That's why I want a C tools package. What if we could take all of your views D7 handlers and make them be plugins in Drupal 10? So you recreate your view, but what if we can reuse that code? Same for panels panes. Can we, or sorry, C tools content types, which turn into panel panes. You have all these content types in there. What if we can turn those into blocks for you? So that way, when you use the layout builder or whatever else, the blocks are there. That's on the roadmap. I would say there isn't a public roadmap, but it's in my brain on like the next step. <laughs> because a lot of this is being driven by people using it and what will get their project off the ground faster. So that's been in the whole like, this would be really cool to chase, but I don't know how much value it immediately drives. And I feel like probably a lot, but theme, the theme, theming part of it was the first hurdle. And that'll be code wide so that the kid are Yes, <laughs> that'll be it, that will come. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not gonna say a thing. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna go with there and then there. Okay. Uh, and if you wanted to ask if any performance testing has been done? No, there's no performance testing done, but luckily most of this work happens on discovery. So like hook menu, it oh, I should have put the code up. Um, hook menu, so when, it, when the Drupal routing is dispatched, and I think it's the alter hook, so it's like routing alter, that's when retrofit taps in and says, I'm gonna go call hook menu, and it actually has its own registry because Drupal will discover the menu system, the, the routing, the menus, menu links, actions and tasks, all in four separate calls. So it actually has its own runtime cache of those, so that way it doesn't recall hook menu like five times. But there has been no performance testing, but again, most of it happens at discovery of plugins, so I don't see a lot of impact there possibly. Like same with like theme registry rebuild, um, how the templating, templating theme functions work is it's a twig template with a twig function. So the twig function calls the twig, or the twig function calls the theme function. Minuscule overhead, same with like the PHP template because it's not, oh man, how does that even work? <laughs> I'm trying to remember, the template, it includes the source and renders it. I, I wish I could exactly remember how the template support works, but it calls Drupal render because again, the render array structure hasn't really changed. So like form API render structure, mostly untouched. So those parts are easy. You know, it's not like it's doing a process in the background. It's not adding a lot of extra steps. It's just more so hooking into the discovery process of things. If anything, it might be more, it might make your Drupal 7 code more performant because Drupal's better at caching some discovery items. So in the future, the question is, what is the, how does the future of retrofit play out? Like we've talked about some of these advancements, when are they going to come? Um, a lot of it has been waiting for today to gauge feedback because has been a project I've invested maybe like 25 hours in, maybe 30, like poke at it here and there. Um, and, and then people start using it and then go fix things and then gauging the feedback. So kind of before I get very developer-y where I'm like, I'm gonna lock myself away for a week and just build this thing. I'm older now, I got three kids. I don't have that kind of time. So I'm doing like the product fit shopping right now. I did it at a few conferences, people are like, great, and I'll hear me like, gauging the feedback, and that's gonna be 
when I put more concrete steps in because I want to make sure people see the value in it or they see the value in it, but not just like, cool, but we're still going to do it the old way mm -hmm. type of thing. And in, in those speeches, uh, you mentioned that you would like to show that you have your best plan. Yes. So the question is if I have a plan for seat tools. And I think it's going to be what I work on here at DrupalCon, to be honest, to do a proof of concept. Um, I would like to finish, the problem is that there's still like finishing field support and then I wanted to hook into custom entity definitions because like how cool would it be if you don't have to rewrite hook entity info. Um, but again, it seems like seats, again, talking, C tools, it seems like as cool as that would be, getting C tools plugin support, which probably would help you too, right Darren? I, I've already done that. Oh, that's right. He's, Darren has, so Darren has a merge request against C tools D7 that makes it compatible. I would like it to just have a package so they don't have to merge um, so yeah, that's going to be part of DrupalCon, is coming up with that roadmap, come up with some better concrete plans, because then people have faith in the project also when they can see that. So it's me product shopping for, for feedback, and then writing stuff so that way people are like, yes, I will use this. Um, yeah, uh, let's not uh, depend on Matt to, to do all these things that we're talking about. I'll be here for contribution day, join me, we'll be doing a lot of these things as we work on them together, it won't take so hard. Yes. Oh, So, this is a me thing. This is, this is me. Um, Darren has been a great contributor, the, the one main contributor, and that is part of the plan, again, product shopping and roadmap. You're like, okay, is it moving the work to Drupal.org with GitLab? Honestly, I can't, I like, I don't mind working with Drupal issues or Drupal projects, but like when I want to be quick, oh my goodness, I can't click 5,000 things on the Drupal issue. Um, so, once we move to like GitLab issues, I might move it there so that way it can be easier to do governance and maintainership. Um, but also there's only been a handful of people using it, well maybe more than a handful, but that are poking at and contributing. So like I wanna create a plan so it could be community owned. All right, wait, I wanna make sure, ah, then I'll get to. I mean, add CSP to your site and the content security. Oh, sorry, the question is, sorry, let me repeat for the recording. Um, Drupal add JS was removed for a reason. To, or actually, the ability to add inline JavaScript was moved for a specific reason for security, and now the code might be calling it. And is that a bigger issue? I would say yes, it could be. But also, it's really hard to know, is that line of Drupal Add.js adding inline JavaScript, or is it saying, hey, register a file that's not part of a library, or is it um, JavaScript settings? So that's one where everyone here is probably using PHP stand to do static analysis for their code to keep it nice and tidy. <laughs> you could write like a PHP stand rule. Like, th actually, that'd be really cool if Retrofit had like a PHP stand rule that says, great, you're on Drupal 10. Here's some rules that tell you to go clean up your code. Like one is, you still have Drupal add JS. Go convert it to a library or find some other way to do it. A lot of these, it's one of like, where does Retrofit's job end and where is it the owners of the code's job to be like, all right, well, we ported it, let's go audit X, Y, and Z things. But that's where I think it is a responsibility of the project. It's like, hey, we made these things keep working. You should really get your template.php files on a twig. Um, when I first announced this, Alex Bronstein made a comment about the security issues with PHP template. Because one, one great thing about Twig is it auto escapes by default. In Drupal 7, you had to take like user input and do like XSS filter by default. Now granted, Drupal only did it for like field labels and a handful of other things and everybody writing custom code probably forgot to do this. So like it was, it's latent, like it's still there. But that could be like one thing, it's like just it, it, I, it could provide in the next steps, like, great, you're running. Get your templates on Twig. Look for Drupal Add JS, these next steps, and then go through and like port your database queries and all that.
So the question is like, how could the community and organizations that are using this support me? I do have a GitHub sponsor, so if you want to do that, because this is what I do on some of my nights and weekends, and that gives me some fun money. We have a pool, I had to replace it. So that was a great dent in my wallet. <laughs> um, or, or just ask for mentorship. I mean, just jump in and be like, hey, we're using it. We can't get this API work. We'd love to test it. And then I can try, to, I would love to start growing the contributors to the project and mentoring. I love mentoring and helping review code to like level people up and make them more comfortable. Um, I would say just use it or just spread the word too. Uh, because them, by them using it, it finds the gaps. By finding and reporting the gaps, other people can more easily step in. And right now, the surface area is very nebulous. So it does very much depend on me because I know some things, Baron knows some things, but where does it go in? And the more that people use it, we find the gaps, we can get more particular issues. So think of it like um, the bolt, like breaking down a boulder when doing project management, like you got a boulder, then you go to the small things and you eventually get to a pebble. Right now, everything's a boulder. Actually, no, it's a media, it's an asteroid because it's so big, but we can start breaking it down and then organizations, then it can be more easy to point their contributors there or say, oh, we're doing this, do you want to sponsor some time? And it's like, great, I'm gonna take some time and just crank it out. Um, yeah, a lot of that is still, like I said, in flux as like it's been incubating. I know it's been a year since I announced it, but it's still just like proving it out, shopping product feedback, DrupalCon's the best place to try to do that. And I couldn't make it to Pittsburgh last year, so. Any other questions? I know we're coming up on time. All right, or in the back and then to you. Yes, um, sorry, my hearing is really bad. Um, you have things that you want to show, not a technical person, show me. Can we do it after the questions? Or is it a question related to that? Okay. Here, real quick, we'll bump to the other question, then we'll tackle this. Here, real quick. The question is, is there any pushback from the top of the community? And if there was, what would I do? To be frank, not care, because I have a lot of strongly held opinions about what the Drupal community is doing wrong, and I don't want to get into them here. Um, <laughs> Got it. Would the yeah, would there be a problem where like it gets really big and then like the committers like this is a, I don't think so because they want people to stay on Drupal too. And that's the idea. It's like, I don't want people leaving Drupal. And, and like, my background with e-commerce, every time a new executive came in, it's like Drupal commerce, so let's go to Magento because that's what I did for the past 20 years. <sighs> like replatforms are possible, but if we can provide tools that prevent it, I, I don't think anybody's gonna argue against that. And if they do, it's like, we've got all the way other problems. <laughs> that too. No, nobody's setting. In, in fact, the feedback has been like, this is great. And the biggest concern is like, is it just me? <laughs> so, you know, you should check the Acquia booth because I heard if you hack core, you release a dragon. Just as a plug. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to go through these questions real quick. So what would be the major problems to implement a portal theme or port a theme? A portal. a portal theme, which many contributed modules are used, such as university theme. Okay, I did work on a university site before, and there was like an install profile that extended an extend profile that was customized, and then did a theme and a theme and a theme and a theme. The, I think the biggest, there's lots of challenges, but it's just the fact that it is so interdependent, and over time, the edges bleed or blur is a better way to put it. So one of the ideas I want to take is, does everybody remember the Omega theme? How there was like Alpha Omega and then you had the sub theme. I know we had the agency theme that, oh, wrap it up. Okay. Um, <laughs> that is probably, I, I want to try exploring that. And I can take, I'll sidebar these questions to you after. Okay. Thank you everybody for coming. Woo!